Welcome everyone to the Northern Regions webinar on pest prospects for spring. My name is Tonya Grundy. I'm an extension officer with the entomology team at Queensland's Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. Our presenters are Melina Miles, Hugh Breyer and Adam Quady from DAF and Zeritza Durek from New South Wales DPI. So our webinar today begins with an overview of wet season issues. So over to Hugh Melina. Thank you very much, Tonya. So I don't think it uh, will come as any surprise to any of you looking at this map to see just how wet it has been. And I think that the um, the prospects for spring and summer are you know, pretty wet as well. And it's been a while since I think we've, we've had a pretty wet year. Probably 2016 was the last taste that we had of that. And then sort of early 2000, mid 2000s before that. It often takes agronomists and growers by surprise to encounter a suite of pests that they haven't seen for a while. So we thought this would be a great opportunity just to highlight what those are and to help you get a bit of an understanding of what some of the drivers are. I know that not every region has been as wet as some. And you know, it might help you just to have a bit of an understanding of what those drivers are. So the real drivers of high pest pressure in these wetter years are really around the availability of host plants, be they crops or non-crop hosts. Often in a wet winter particularly, the temperatures are warmer. So availability of hosts plus warmer temperatures are key drivers for pest abundance. And what that means is that by the time we get to spring, the pests are already there. They may have not gone into overwintering diapores or they may have continued to tick away on hosts. You have a bigger starting population earlier, which means you can fit more generations into the spring and summer. And that just results in an increase in population over time. So the, the species that we understand really well as being driven by these combination of factors are things like Helicoverpa armidra, aphids, soil insects and pod sucking bugs. There's a, there's a whole suite more which I'll show you in a minute and will be talked about by the other presenters as well. The other part of the equation when it comes to pest abundance in these seasons is the migratory species, those that build up outside of the local areas, like in Western Queensland. And some of those that we know really well are native armyworms that build up on grasses after particularly wet seasons, green mirrored and brown mirrored, brother glen bug, and of course, Helicoverpa punctigera. So we keep an eye not only on what's happening in the coastal or relatively coastal cropping areas, but also what's happening in those source areas for the species that we know something about. But I guess there are, uh, particularly when it comes to the migratory species, they can build up, but there's another component that needs to come into play for them to arrive in the cropping areas. And that's the right meteorological conditions, the right winds to carry them from, you know, the northwest or the west into the cropping areas easily, but also an inclination for them to move from those hosts. So things like drying conditions in the spring, which means that those hosts in the western source areas are no longer suitable and the species are inclined to get up and take advantage of, of appropriate meteorological conditions to move. The other thing that we can see is an increase in fungal pathogens and bacteria and NPVs in populations that are really favoured by these wet conditions. So often it's hard to see those just because the pest pressure is so high, but those things we can expect to see a lot more of in wet seasons. This is probably one of the things that we'll send around or put on the beat sheet, you know, just to give you a bit of understanding of, of what it is that drives those local build up populations. So depending on which aphids could be breeding up on native legumes or volunteer legumes, on crucifers, on grasses, depending on which species. Things like Helicoverpa, you know, really wide host range. So things that it might have got to go on in sow thistle or flea bane and so on in fallows, they'll be driving those. Similarly, rather glen bug and sorghum midge, I guess, is worth mentioning because in years when we get a lot of Johnson grass early, they are years when we have high abundance of sorghum midge, higher abundance and earlier populations. And for migratory pests, it's a similar scenario, except that, you know, it is the native wildflowers and herbs that are, are dominating that host list. And we know that we've had quite a bit of rain in the West, uh, where we know that things like myriads and native budworm come from. And those conditions remain pretty good from my understanding. And then I'll just put a little circle around here, slugs, you know, something that we rarely see in the northern region, but in these wetter seasons where the soil remains moist, they can persist for a very long time. Other considerations that are, are worth mentioning is just the challenges that you'll face with the wet conditions in terms of getting to crops and doing the monitoring in a timely way and even getting on to treat if that's necessary. 
And sampling in wet conditions with a beet sheet and a sweep net, nothing to be too excited about, really can be quite challenging. And the other thing I guess that we, we haven't seen for a while is the weathering and the secondary infection by fungi and bacteria of pods particularly, or even damaged stems and roots, that you know has a much greater impact on yield and quality than we would see in a dry year. And you know, this sort of thing down here on the bottom left hand side of really where the chickpeas is a sort of thing that we haven't seen for quite some time. Damage to sunflower heads by healies or loopers of no consequence in a dry season, but allows access of fungal pathogens that can cause head rots and so on in wetter years. So I think that these are reminders to prepare yourself. And I think in terms of preparation, I'll talk a little bit about Darabug, a tool that's available to help you forecast what might happen with those pest populations if there's an interruption to your ability to monitor, to follow up on a spray efficacy or to put on a treatment. I think that that's all that I want to say just in terms of a brief introduction. And I think that Hugh, it's over to you now to talk about specifically the implications for summer pulse pests. Yep. I'll talk about the impact of these wetter seasons on key summer pulse pests. We'll have some specific examples. And as Melina mentioned, we've got more early season hosts for the pests. And they can build up early and then move into our later crops. We can also foster an invasion of more coastal pests. Maybe that was because they're in the area anyway, but in a wetter year, there are many more hosts and things like Langium web spinners, bean pod borer, et cetera. You're going to get many more of those in a wet year in the more inland areas. On the plus side, though, crops are better able to compensate for pest damage than hot, dry seasons. And sometimes if you've got cooler, more cloudy summers, you've got lower maximum temperatures and that slows the development down of some key pests, some of the stem boring beetles, uh, and they only reach a larger size later in the crop's life. And as Melina mentioned, too much rain does impede sampling and spraying. Often when we've got a wetter spring summer, we've got a greater overlap of the winter crops and the spring crops. And the classic one would be winter cereals and mung beans. In a scenario like that, you've got more chance of seedling thrips moving into the spring mung beans. And they can cause pretty awful looking damage. So you can see that damage there. And it looks as though someone's been across with a horrible herbicide and smashed them. So you would say we need to spray, yay or nay. Ladbrokes will take a bet on this. And here, this is 20 days post spray with the registered rate. and was it worthwhile? And you would look at that and you'd say yes, but one of those rows wasn't sprayed. This is what I didn't tell you. So you can see the unsprayed versus the sprayed. And you look at that and the benefit of hindsight, you could say, well, there was no need to spray. So our recommendation is, if in doubt, lead unsprayed strips. Uh, the grower did that and without that, it's very hard to say one way or the other, but with this knowledge, you can. Example two, bean pod borer. So this is what we regard as the classic La Nina pest. So it's common on the coast and in the tropics, but in wet years, we're more likely to get it inland and they can come through the burnet to the inner downs, uh, to Billawheeler and even to Emerald. And why? Well, probably more early hosts, things like Sesbania. If we're in an area where they're spasmodic, they can catch us unawares and we forget yet what the early signs look like. And we do need to be on, on our watch because I have seen populations in the Burnet in a bad year, 100 per square metre. So you've got 10 there in that rectangular arrangement. Multiply that by 10 and that's how many we had per square metre. So you need to scout from very early budding. So pick that start of first budding. If you don't, the moths will find it. First sign will be the moth, so use a sweep net. Second sign, a small larva, but they're out of sight in the flowers. so they feed inside the flowers. You won't know they're there until you get webbing of buds and flowers. So what we need to do is open flowering racemes to look for the larva. Good news is in a wet year, the plant is much more able to compensate for early damage, provided we catch it before it's too late. Because if we've got large larva in the pods, yeah, the horse is bolted. So we don't want that. Other confounding factor is that bean pod borer moths are often confused with beet web burnt moths, and the larvae of those are a very minor pest feeding mainly on black pigweed. The pod borer moths rest with their wings outspread, but the beet web worm rests with them folded back. 
and have also much browner uh, hind wings. And it's no coincidence we get an increase of these in, in wetter years because you get more black pigweed and they're, uh, they feed on that. So that's a plus really. Mirrors in mung beans, the mirrored risk traditionally is higher in warmer summers when we've got more frequent northwest winds. If we get a wet summer with predominantly southeast winds, you get lower populations. And the other extreme, though, is if you get extreme temperatures, the populations will crash. But on average, yeah, in a cooler summer, you might expect less mirrored activity. Don't forget the nymphs. So 80% of the population can often be nymphs. If we're sampling with a wet beach sheet, they might be harder to pick up. So just be aware of that and be aware of what they look like. And we mentioned crops being more tolerant of damage in wetter weather, and this would certainly apply to vegetative soya beans. So I've put a couple of pictures there, even the one on the right initially, you might think, well, that looks pretty awful, but that really is level is of no concern. What you've got to do is look at all the leaves and average the percent defoliation. So our eyes always go to the most damaged leaves and miss the ones that with least damage. And our IPM option would be to go soft and Healy NPV product, my Vivus Max. By that way, we can save the beneficials for later in the season. And going soft early really is a key Healy insect resistant management strategy. And that's very important at present. Other point to put up, vegetative soyas are at greater risk of healing in dry years. So for whatever reason the bomb was incorrect or you ended up in a rain shadow and your crop was stressed, just be aware that healies are more likely to attack the auxiliary buds, which are wetter than the leaves as the crop dries down. So the auxiliary buds are at the junction of the stem and the petioles, and they're the forerunners for the floral buds. So in a very dry season, Healy will target that, so you need to be on your vigilant best to pick that up before it's too late, because you can get collateral damage. They chew on the auxiliary bud, they lash round, chew the stem, and the stem above that chewing mark dies. The pod suckers too, so long wet summers give a buildup of pod sucking bugs. You also see that in the burdekin, uh, where they really don't, compared to down here, don't have a winter, and you can have winter and summer soybeans, and so they build. Correct identification is important, so don't mix Pisidorus up with green veggie bug. Remember, the female red bandits have pink bands, but the males just have cream band. If you look at the green veggie bugs at the top of the slide there, you can see there's no cream band across the shoulders. In the tropics too, there's the confusion. Often a lot of the females have pale bands, not pink. So just be aware of the difference. Very important because when we control them for the red banded, we need shield that's under permit, uh, plus the max effectant. There is a key restraint for that. If you look at the permit label, it says do not apply if heavy rains or storms are forecast within three days. So in a wet summer, that's rather frightening. So we need to be on the ball so we can go in and spray when we need to before that deadline is, is breached. Last one, loosen crown borer. So it's can be very damaging in soybeans. It is less damaging in cooler, wetter years, though, because the lower temperatures slow the larval development. And so the beast does not reach the pre-pupil stem girdling stage until the plants are in late pod fill or later. So the development slowed down. When they are going to pupate, they ring bark the stem internally and plug the pupil chamber. If that occurs before your pods are filled, you lose a lot of yield. If that occurs when your pods are fully filled, and provided you've got a good plant stand so that dead plants don't uh, collapse, you'll lose very little yield. There is a seed treatment. There's a permit number there. It's a neonic treatment. We're saying only apply if you've got a history of bad segreda. So typical thresholds would be about 10% of plants girdled at the early stages before uh, early to mid pod fill. So the take home message is just plan ahead. Be aware of what might be coming your way. What Pests are likely to be more damaging. Uh, bone up on the ID, be aware of any pesticides you might need and, and uh, contact your supplier just to see there are supplies because I know with other pesticides there have been COVID sort of limitations. Take advantage of any breaks in the weather. So there's a break in the weather, but fine to get out there and sampling, be ready to spray. Be aware of any wet weather pesticide restraints. And if you've got any specific questions, contact myself, the contact details there, or the young and upcoming Trevor Volp, that's his number there, and that's the DAF email address. So please, any questions you've got, we certainly welcome.
Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. And sorry, sorry, over to you. OK, thanks. I will tell you a few things about if it's and virus outlook in pulse and all seed crops. If it's are pretty much depending on environmental conditions, such as temperature, rainfall, moisture, wind direction, etc. And all these environmental conditions affect their migration, presence and landing in crop. For several years, we conducted the aphid monitoring program, and I would like to share with you some from that uh, monitoring in Lucent crop. You can see that there is great diversity in number of aphids landing in Lucent crop. In uh, 2020, we had early peak in numbers, mid of April. So that happened just after two years of drought. But, uh, we had quite a rainfall in uh, January and February, which were followed with the uh, development of green bridge and aphid the multiplication in that. After that, aphid moved into faba bean crop, which was early sowed, especially in uh, Northwest and New South Wales in Murray Plains and caused severe damages in these crops year after that was quite different. So 2021 uh, data showed very low aphid presence, as you can see, comparing to previous year. All this actually didn't cause uh, much damage in faba bean crop like previous year, even though there was green bridge developed, etc. Uh, however, this year was found to be quite wet and cooler comparing to previous year and had a very, very early April frost that definitely affected aphid landing in early sold faba bean crop. This year, 2022, numbers were quite high in February because obviously we had quite good green bridge developed. However, again, quite wet conditions in uh, March and April affected aphid numbers, which dropped and continue dropping coming into a uh, winter season. So I could say from my data that they are definitely in um, comp compatible with uh, data from Yapwal Noor from virus presence in pulse crops. So I just want to mention, yeah, what we faced this year in uh, Northwest New South Wales, it was quite wet uh, in all our monitoring sites through whole summer. So it didn't affect only us, it affected all insects and affected growers and uh, agronomists uh, the most. I, I presume so. Uh, the situation with pulse viruses was followed with the situation uh, that happened in aphid landing uh, data. As I said, in 2020, after two years of drought, we had summer rains and uh, developed green bridge uh, where aphids very likely picked up seed-borne viruses such as being yellow and uh, alpha-alpha mosaic virus. And accordingly, they spread it in uh, early sowed faba beans because faba bean was very early sowed uh, that year. Growers had full soil pro profile. Uh, and everything was ready for actually really good year. However, you can see from this photo, this was quite bad year for uh, faba bean growers, especially in west of uh, Mori, where very severe damages and uh, virus infestation happened. However, year after that, even though we had uh, quite good green bridge, very low uh, aphid numbers actually caused very low virus presence. So even though we found some spots with cowpea if it present in faba bean crop. TBIA test uh, samples uh, showed very low presence of virus, including bean yellow, alpha alpha mosaic virus, and bean leaf row mosaic virus. This year, I'm sharing this data from Yop Van Lur a large increase in canola area, uh, which was actually affected this year with turnip yellow uh, viruses and turnip mosaic viruses. However, you can see that the distribution map shows that the biggest number of positive examples were coming from Narabra area and Dabo, and uh, minor infections were with turnip mosaic virus. Uh, on the other hand, pulse viruses were not uh, issued this year in northern New South Wales. And as I said, it's compatible with aphid presence and aphid numbers this year. Just to uh, mention that uh, all these viruses uh, have their symptoms. For me, to be honest, they look pretty much similar, but I'm not expert in this. I'm not sure how are you managing all this issue, but I would advise you all to contact best person. So in Northern New South Wales, that would be Yop Van Lur. I'm sure QDAP has their own experts in this. So if you're experiencing anything like this in your crop, please contact adequate person and according to their instructions and for identification.
Apart from pulse viruses, Yapon Lor mentioned that, that there is a, a high level of turnip yellow viruses in Kanala. So their symptoms look like this. And they can often be confused with nutrient def uh, deficiencies or abiotic stress. So again, uh, if you are um, seeing something like this in your canola, follow uh, instructions and send uh, examples for identification of viruses. So in uh, canola, um, there are different virus vectors. They are all, of course, aphids. In canola, that's green breech aphid, that's main vector. In pulses, uh, there are different pulse aphids. However, in pulses, there are uh, mainly seed-borne viruses that persist in legume pastures. In canola, they are not seed-borne viruses and infections uh, are usually, again, coming from weeds or summer crops. What are uh, main pulse aphids that you can see in your crop and that you have to manage on time? Uh, of course, there, there is uh, cowpea aphids. So cowpea aphid uh, usually makes issues and problems in papa bean crops if it lands very early in season. That's again during autumn. However, uh, they can come back uh, you know, this spring and secondary infections can uh, occur. So I would like to just uh, let you know that you need to continue on monitoring uh, this spring because their numbers are increasing. Their hosts are different legumes, including uh, field peas, fava beans, lucerne, flower, etc. Uh, and they can transmit different viruses, including uh, cucumber mosaic virus, virus uh, bean yellow, alpha alpha, turnip yellow, and peat seed borne mosaic virus. Apart from cowpea aphid, the pea aphid the numbers are increasing this spring, and there are uh, known pests of pulse crops. There are the identification together with identification of other uh, aphids. I won't actually yeah, go in detail with that at this stage, so I would like to invite you to be part of our workshops, which will be held in uh, Queensland uh, and northern New South Wales in October. So we will go more in detail with all these issues. I would just like to mention that uh, there are yeah, multiple aphids that uh, you can see in your pulse crops. So one of them is pea aphid that looks pretty much similar to a blue-green aphid. But pea aphid is known as one of the best vectors of bean leaf roll virus. So uh, according to our experiment, uh, that is uh, aphid that showed the biggest percentage of transmission uh, in um, uh, of bean leaf roll virus uh, in faba beans uh, in our experiment. So apart from bean leaf roll, that cucumber mosaic virus vector being yellow, AMV and PC borne mosaic virus. As I said, they look pretty much similar to blue green aphid, which is more issue in lucerne, but can infest fava beans and bring different viruses, including cucumber mosaic virus and bean yellow mosaic virus. Apart from pulse viruses, I would like to bring your attention to green peach aphid as one of main vectors of turnip yellow viruses in uh, canola, but also uh, it can transmit viruses in other crops such as pulse crops and lupins. So this aphid uh, makes uh, management even more difficult because uh, it developed resistance to different uh, insecticides. And apart uh, from that, it has different habits with landing and uh, infestation in your crops. So if you go uh, in your crop now, you will hardly find these aphids because they distribute across crop evenly. Uh, so they uh, usually do not form clusters, which makes you know, inspection more difficult. So just pay attention and uh, try to monitor uh, your crop constantly to be on top of your duties and be ready for any management approach. So this is important factor of turnip yellow, turnip mosaic virus, uh, cucumber mosaic virus, and pea seed borne mosaic virus. And um, economic damages are uh, usually bigger on young plants. However, you still need to pay attention to it at this stage in your all seed crops. Other than green peach aphid, at this stage, uh, numbers of turnip aphid and cabbage aphid, uh, their numbers are, are increasing, especially you can find it uh, in tips uh, of canola plants forming uh, very intense colonies. Comparing to green peach aphid, they are quite different. Uh, they form boxy coating, uh, especially cabbage aphid, uh, so uh, it makes identification even easier. However, they are also very good virus vectors, especially for turnip yellow viruses. So pay attention, follow the label and apply necessary control in your canola crop when wetter and actually uh, growth stage of canola uh, permits. 
The thing that I would like to more in detail is uh, Faba bin Aphid. So uh, Faba bin Aphid became a big issue this year because of availability of moisture and green bridge. It was found in Australia in 2016, uh, started to spread in 2017 when we found it here in Tamworth in Brisa. And two years of drought obviously affected its distribution. We couldn't find it for two years of drought, so 2018 and 19. However, it came back in 2020. Uh, when we first we found it in uh, Grafton, so very likely it survived in coastal area, in some pasture legumes or in private gardens or something like that, where uh, this green bridge was available. In 2021, we were faced with uh, its distribution and yeah, progress uh, further uh, in New South Wales. And also in October 2021, was found for first time in Queensland. Papa bin aphid is spreading and uh, it reached um, uh, actually central west New South Wales and Riverina, very likely surviving on um, lucerne and pasture legumes. So it is uh, not difficult to identify it. It in fact likes uh, primary uh, hosts are faba bean and veg, however, can survive on other uh, legumes such as pea, lentil, and persist on subclover and lucerne. It can transmit also uh, viruses such as bean leaf oil and pea seed borne mosaic virus, which uh, makes a bigger problem to us. I won't go in detail with cereal aphids. However, would would like just to explain that because so many inquiries were sent to us with rose grown aphid, thinking that it is uh, Russian with aphid. So rose grown aphid uh, it uh, is green and looking pretty much like Russian with aphid. However, there there are some differences. Uh, firstly, if you uh, have your magnifier, you will find this line across, so dark green line across their body, and their coda is only one, not double coda like with. Russian weed aphid, also Russian weed aphid almost doesn't have a siphunculus or a exhaust pipe, so all these characters are uh, helping you to identify it. However, if you are not sure, please yeah, pack samples or make some photos sent to us for identification. For Russian weed aphid, you have to go in field and uh, find symptomatic plants and unroll them to find them inside of uh, roll leaves. So far, Russian with aphid uh, reached Tambor, so that's the north side, but that happened in 2019. Since then, we haven't seen it uh, here uh, in northern New South Wales. Uh, however, it's present in southern New South Wales uh, and uh, further south. If you want to inspect your crop, just look for stressed area and uh, find for some uh, symptomatic plants looking like this. Uh, unrolled leaves, and if you find stripes on your leaves together with aphids, it's very likely having Russian with aphids in your crop. It will arrive in back in um, you know, northern New South Wales and maybe uh, distribute further north. We don't know when it's going to happen, but uh, we just ask of you to pay attention to um, you know, what's happening this spring in your crop. Russian with aphid is easy to manage, so manageable, um, and uh, there is action threshold calculator uh, developed with uh, GRDC fundings to help you to actually determine if there uh, is need to treat uh, Russian with the aphid or not. Just pay attention to beneficials because they definitely can handle these little bugs, especially in springtime. So yeah, uh, give them a chance. The DPI is part of Project Improved Management of Rutherland Bug in Northern Region, together with University uh, of Queensland and uh, Saro as uh, leader of this project. Uh, this project is uh, founded by GRDC. We are uh, monitoring uh, Rutherland Bug numbers in uh, multiple sites. Uh, Rutherland Bug can easily be mistaken for gray cluster bug, which is minor pest. Gray cluster bug was not an issue uh, last year, even though it was dominant species in our crops uh, that we monitored. Rutherland bug has its own development stages that could affect different crops, including canola and uh, summer crops. And higher risk is when wet winter uh, spring happen, like this one, and if it's followed with dry uh, spring summer, risk is even higher. So just pay attention because uh, it has multiple hosts, uh, including different heats that
that can support its um, you know, reproduction. Last year, we didn't actually find um, you know, bigger numbers of retrogland bug. Gray cluster bug was dominant species in our monitoring sites, which is happening also this season. So at this stage, a dominant species in uh, canola and pasture is uh, gray cluster bug, but uh, there is uh, quite a big chance that retrogland bug uh, uh, will find its way with this season to you know, make it true and form uh, in bigger numbers. So just pay attention, monitor your crop uh, and surroundings and um, yeah, uh, be on top of your yeah, duties for this season. Thank you. Over to you, Melina. Okay, thank you very much. So I mentioned earlier that there's a very handy tool available uh, that has been developed through a collaboration of uh, entomologists across the country and uh, investment from GRDC. And it's called Darabug2, and it's there are a couple of ways you can find it. You can get it get to it through the beat sheet under the resources tab, or you can go directly using the URL to Caesar Australia website where it's housed. Now, if you've ever rung up to say, what do you think armyworm might be doing in my winter cereal crop and is the crop going to mature before the armyworm get big enough to do head lopping or significant defoliation, I will have run this tool for you to try and get a picture of for your area how rapidly they're developing and whether you're going to get a coincidence of a drying down crop and large damaging larvae. Similarly, for Helicoverpa, for example, in attempting to use virus, knowing, you know, how long it will be until an egg lay gets to third or fourth instar when you sort of pass that, that window of opportunity. So I thought it was a really good opportunity in a season that might be quite challenging in terms of getting timing just as you might want it to be able to run this model. And so I've just got some screen grabs that will help you to sort of get started. And I, I definitely think it's pretty worthwhile. So this is what you will see when you get to the Darabug2 site. You get to select the species that you want to look at. And in, for this example, I've selected uh, common armyworm, which is the uh, spring cereal pest. In terms of grain pests, this is the suite of species that you might be interested in or in cotton. There are a number of other species that relate probably more to horticulture. But so there's a good selection of species that we're interested in. Then you get to select the date of observation and the life stage that you've observed. And those are all click down boxes for you to uh, select larger life stages. In this instance, I've selected a first instar. So first instar common armyworm on the 30th of September. I've put in a, a location. Uh, so it basically uses a gridded extrapolation of the data uh, available temperature data. And so this is for the Darling Downs. Then you get to select the range of temperature data that you would like to use. And I guess what we know about these temperature data ranges is that the longer it is, the cooler overall the average is. So, you know, if you have a season uh, that's cooler, you would probably use, you know, more years. If it were a, a hot season, you might just use the last 10 years. So it gives you that opportunity to do this. Typically, I just run it for one generation because we're only interested for the most part in the, the cohort that's there. So when you press run, this is the output that you will get, the initial output. It, it gives you a visual indication of the rate of development. So you can see here that this is these are the larval instars through here and then it pupates. So you might be interested in the case of armyworm, you know, when are they going to start pupating? Uh, and it is suggesting that sometime in early November is, is when they would pupate and the risk of crop loss ends. The other thing that's very useful is here, I didn't quite capture it, but it says download as a table. And this is typically how I look at the data to make some sort of estimate of, of what's going on. And it's it'll give you an Excel sheet. And this is what we're interested in. It, it backcasts to when the eggs would probably have been laid. And then it, it runs through those life stages. So if we said about the 30th of, of September, we had a first instar, it then runs through and you know gives you the same information that's here, but you can see, and it also, I think is really useful in helping you to calibrate yourself for the sort of temperatures that you're experiencing. Uh, you might do it for armyworm, you might do it for helicoverpa, you might do it for fall armyworm, et cetera. Just to say, you know, so if I've got a third instar larva, it's going to be third instar for about three or four days, and then, you know, three or four days for fourth, and then these longer 
larger instars uh, and you can tot all that up and just have a sort of little rule of thumb around how many days it would take for that population to go through or the youngest one or the oldest one. So, you know, I think it's a really useful tool for just getting a handle on the differences. The other thing that changes quite a bit is running, you know, for common armyworm in winter cereals, running it in September and running it for November temperatures, it makes a dramatic difference. And it always surprises me how slowly things develop under cooler conditions. So, that sort of relates to that calibration again under under you know if it's a cool and wet season just running that to get a bit of a rule of thumb i think is a really useful thing to do so we'll put those links in the email that comes out later so that you can find your way to uh to darabug 2 and i'm more than happy to help anyone who wants to use it to work your way through it and interpret the output if that's necessary the next thing I think is uh, a fall armyworm update, and I'll let Dan and Quady start with the current situation in terms of fall armyworm activity and contrasting that with the previous season. So Adam, take it away. Thanks, Melina. So if everyone who doesn't know, we're, we've been running um, a fall armyworm trapping network across Queensland and New South Wales over the past couple of years. I guess we'll just quickly run through sort of some interesting things we've been finding. We'll start with the Burdekin, where the outbreak was first prominent. So in 2020, 2021, you can just sort of see uh, numbers the present all year round and went up and down on the presence of host plants. And then come last year, there was no maize growing in the Burdekin region, not much sorghum either. And the numbers reflected that in the, the counts, there wasn't much moth activity. And then this year, we have had an explosion of moths in our three traps up at the Burdekin. You can see it's like off the charts in a way. We haven't ever seen numbers that big. And just out of interest, the numbers they found in the trap didn't equate to high pressure in the sorghum crop. The agronomist reported back that egg mass numbers were about the same as what we got in our winter sorghum at the Burdekin. So it, it, this shows the importance of actually getting in the crop and checking it and not relying on the moth trap numbers. The moth trap numbers basically it gives you a good idea of when the fall armyworm are present in the, the region and sort of give you an idea of migrations like this and also give you an idea of the like in-crop buildup of moths. We really don't know enough about them yet to explain what happened here and where they came from and it just moves through quickly bowen is obviously just south and you can see there bowen has got populations year round and just go up and down with the host availability and then further on south emerald they pretty much have it all year round as well now and obviously a big boost in the autumn but even through winter, they've got a population gone. Now, probably a more interesting part is South Queensland area where they're not present through the winter. You can see Kingaroy and Bowenville. There was a real spike in February, and that was repeated again pretty much last year. And we had just a build-up in spring and then a big spike in um, January, February, where I guess that's when um, most crops would be under the highest pressure and you've got to make sure you're sampling in crop. Gatton is a, a bit of a, a different case to the Dying Downs and South Burnett. It's got a bit of a warmer climate, not as many frosts, so you can sort of see the scale there. It tends to get a bit bigger populations for more of the year. And just New South Wales, it has a very short, sharp sort of season. We've sort of seen the population has a, a small peak in February and then that's it which makes us think that early spring crops probably don't have a lot of pressure but in the February crops you probably want to be checking pretty often and just some summary points it's really important to know that pheromone traps aren't a substitute for in crop checking you, you really got to get in there and pull the plants apart even damage symptoms Melina will probably talk about it more aren't a good indicator for what's in the field Traps are really useful for those mass migration events like the, what we saw in the Burdekins last month and just give you an idea of in-crop build-up 
over a season if there's multiple plantings on your farm. And we're really finding that the availability of sorghum and corn is a major driver to building up the population. Obvious North Queensland have them year round now and it's a really good source, I guess, for other parts of Australia to um, get them from. Southern Queensland, we've just seen low numbers in the summertime compared to North Queensland and the main thing with South Queensland is we get low activity in spring and they're building up to peak in January, which makes us think that spring plantings is probably like ideal because you'll see a lot less full arm, armyworm activity and later ones planted after the new year are going to be under higher pressure. New South Wales, we think it's just really a short period of activity with one small burst, perhaps maybe one to two generations of fall armyworm, and most of this will be in the summertime, so again, spring planting should be fairly clean. Finally, I know there's a fair few people on here that are already part of the, the trapping program, but if you want to be involved, just flick me an email. We'll send you some traps and some lures, and that'd be great. Thanks, Adam. We're uh, fast running out of time, so I'm going to whip through some of these things that I thought it might be of interest. So Adam's described, you know, some of the tactics that are already pretty apparent in terms of minimising the impact of fall armyworm, and probably the most important one that's really clear in, in almost all regions is an early season plant, so a spring plant rather than a summer plant is optimal, will really avoid a lot of the pressure that builds during the season. And I guess the only caveat on that is that I don't think that we've seen the full gamut of what we will see from fall armyworm. You know, we have two years that are quite similar. It is possible that in some years we will have large migrations that come at some point in the season and may mean that that early strategy is less useful. But at the moment, based on what we've seen over the last two years, that does seem to be a really easy way to reduce the pressure on the crops. And so something like this, I think if you're thinking about, you know, where are we going to put our effort when it comes to corn and sorghum and fall armyworm, definitely put it in this establishment phase because you can get seedling death, particularly if there are large infestations or you miss them and you get large larvae that can burrow into the base and kill them. Then there's a period that we're a little bit unsure about here during the vegetative stages up to tassel. And that's where the GRDC investment around the development of economic thresholds comes in, is looking at the different impacts that fall armyworm defoliation can have at different densities on yield and crop growth. So a little bit of haziness here. But what we do know is that, you know, in a season like this where it might be wet, clearly you're going to get a lot more damage to cobs that have holes in them. And fall armyworm, unlike Healy's, will go through the side of the cob. So that increases the risk that you will get significantly more crop loss per larva when they're there at that stage. So that's definitely an alert here. But what we do know from field experience is that once you get past tassel, and the crops no longer producing new leaves, it's much less attractive to fall armyworm than it is in those earlier vegetative stages. So that, uh, I guess, is sort of a really basic cut at a management strategy for fall armyworm at this point. And I would apply that to both sorghum and corn at this point, even though, you know, we have quite good evidence that sorghum is definitely not as good a host as maize. So we've been doing some work with conventional insecticide and looking at which, you know, the relative efficacy of different products. I think that in terms of, you know, you can look at all the larvae together, which makes the data bounce around a little bit. So I think it's a bit more useful to look just at the medium larvae that would come through. And what you can see here is that when the application goes on, this is obviously quite a high density population, you know, four larvae per plant at least in terms of you know medium larvae, we can get very good control of larvae. And then it's all about the persistence of those products. So you can see this bright blue line here is Success Neo, which is probably the most effective product that we have available to us. The other one that I just wanted to bring your attention to is this blue line here, which is Steward. It can knock the population down, but has very low persistence. And I, I guess this is not a product that I would be recommending anybody target a decent fall armyworm population in, particularly in those vulnerable early stages. So if you want to go back and have a look at this data, it'll be on the beach sheet at some point with a bit more explanation. So you'll see that data again if you want to uh, look at it. 
The other thing that we've been looking at is forlogen. We've spent a lot of time looking at forlogen and trying to get it work to work in the field. I guess it's been quite disappointing to see as a standalone that it doesn't hold up, particularly under high pressure. And a similar sort of thing here, you can see the three treatments, which is 100 mils of forlogen, 200 mils of forlogen and an untreated control. If Even when we just look at the total population, there's no difference between those treatments when we look at the control and the suppression of large larvae coming through, again, no difference. So I think it's such a valuable product to provide an alternate to conventional chemistry and to reduce the risk of insecticide resistance developing that DAF will continue to work with Ag Biotech on how we get that product to work as best it can. There's some evidence, I think, that repeated application through overhead irrigation provide some protection and may be a really useful way to deploy this Forlogen Spodoptra MPV in instances where that's possible. The other thing that I just wanted to say is when you're out and about in the crops, you know, many of the natural enemies that you're familiar with from other caterpillar species, things like Helicoverpa and armyworm and so on, have turned their attention very quickly to fall armyworm. And so things like the lady beetles that will eat eggs, the predatory shield bugs that will attack the caterpillars, Fungal pathogens, I guess I've mentioned that they may well be quite prevalent in a wetter season. Spiders, of course, always there. And then trichogramma, it does occur, probably hasn't sort of built up as we might have hoped, and tachinids. But also things that we perhaps have overlooked for other caterpillar pests, things like chelonis, which lays its eggs in the fall armyworm eggs, and then the wasp emerges from the larvae. So there is a suite of natural enemies that are very active on fall armyworm, especially, you know, in most of Australia, where you're likely to see relatively low populations of fall armyworm. Just knowing that they are active is one of the components of monitoring and managing that pest. So that, I think, brings us to the end of the presentations. Thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you for attending.